Well, good morning, everyone. So good to see you and to be with you and to worship. And welcome to our visitors this morning. We're thankful that you're here with us at City of Faith. If you have your Bible, uh, please open it to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John. We're going to start to make our way through this letter today. And the title of this sermon, if you take notes, is the Word of Life. The Word of Life. Now, <clears throat> I've always been fascinated with, with trials. I come from a family uh, that is full of lawyers. Uh, my aunt is a retired judge. I have other family members that are involved in law in some way, and so I don't know if it's in the blood, but every now and then I go on YouTube and I'll look at and I'll watch a high-profile trial. And I like to listen to, to all the witnesses as they are asked, what did you see? Did you hear anything? Did you have any interaction with the victim? Did you have any interaction with the defendant? And all these testimonies are, are brought together to see if they match to see if they corroborate. And all of this is a, a part of this process in order to arrive at the truth. Uh, what actually happened? Uh, what actually took place? Is this person guilty or is he innocent? Who has the right here? And it's amazing how this, this idea that there is no absolute truth disappears in the courtroom. Everyone cares about absolute truth when he or she has been wronged. And that is because everyone knows deep down that truth matters. The truth matters. And if it matters in earthly circumstances, such as in a courtroom, how much more does it matter in spiritual matters? As to who God is, as to what God has done, as to eternal life, the truth matters. Because right doctrine leads to salvation. Wrong doctrine leads to damnation. And so when lies come up and attack the person of God, who He is, what He has done, faithful men rise up to bear witness to the truth. To defend the truth to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, as it says in Jude 3. Why? Because eternity is at stake. Souls are at stake. The truth matters. And that's what John is doing here in this introduction to the epistle. He's taking the stand as a witness to the truth, as a witness to the word of life. So if you have your Bible, let's, let's read these four verses. Follow with me. Chapter 1, verse 1. <clears throat> the Word of God says, What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the Word of life. And the life was manifested... And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we have seen and heard, we proclaim to you also, so that you too may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. These things we write so that our joy may be made complete. I want to set five headings before you this morning if you take notes. The first heading is the immutable word of life. That is the unchanging word of life. John says in verse 1, what was from the beginning? Let's stop right there. 
Now, if you were to sit down and read through this epistle, five chapters in one sitting, which I encourage you to do if you've never done that, you would quickly realize that this man, this apostle, John, likes to repeat himself a lot. And you would also notice that his argument is not always linear in his thought. And we see that from the get-go here in verse 1, where he says, what was from the beginning? And so the first thing that we need to do is to answer, what is the what? What is the what that was from the beginning? And he gives us the answer at the end of verse 1, where he says, concerning the word of life. This is the subject, the word of life, which was from the beginning. And as we read the immediate context, verses 1 through 4, we realize that this word of life is more than a what, but it is actually a who. John is talking here about the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And this is why most of our translations, if you look at your translations, most of them will either capitalize the word word or the word life or both. Because it's telling us, the, the, the translators are telling us, John has Jesus Christ in mind here. This entire epistle is Christocentric. It is centered upon Christ. Why? Because the heresy, as we saw last week, the heresy that had entered into the church was attacking what? It was attacking the person and the work of Christ. So it's kind of like in Colossians. We went through the book of Colossians. It was a similar heresy. Gnostics had come into the church denying the deity of Christ, denying the humanity of Christ. And so Colossians was heavily Christocentric. But then again, most of the Bible, every book in the Bible, in some way, is Christocentric because it all points to Christ. When Jesus raised from the grave, he is walking with those two disciples on the way to Emmaus, and he opened up their minds to understand what all the scriptures said about him that it all points to Christ. And so it's Christocentric. Jesus is the Word. This is a popular designation or title that John gives to Jesus Christ. He is the Word. We all know the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Trinitarian language, the Son and the Father. And then John 1.14 reveals to us that this Word is the incarnate Christ. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then we have one of my favorite verses in Revelation, Revelation 19.13. This is talking about the, the second coming of Christ. It says, He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood. And His name is called the Word of God. Well, what does it mean that Jesus is the Word? What does that mean? Well, what do we use words for? We use words to communicate, to express ideas. And we use words to communicate because God, our Creator, uses words to communicate. This is how He has revealed Himself. Our God is a God who speaks. We see that from Genesis 1-3. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And so when John says that Jesus is the Word, what he is saying is that Jesus is the ultimate, final, and complete revelation of God. That the Son has come to make the Father known. To reveal God to us in the complete sense of the Word. Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2 says, God after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets and in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And then John 1.18, the Gospel of John. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, that is the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. 
And so Jesus came, He was manifested, this word of life, to give us a message of eternal life. To reveal to us how man might have eternal life. How man might be reconciled to God. How man might know God and have fellowship with, with God. And this is why in 1 John 5.20, at the very end of this epistle, John says, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true, and we are in Him who is true in His Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God an eternal life. And this is why John says, what was from the beginning, instead of he who was from the beginning. Because John wants to emphasize not only the person of Christ, but the message that Jesus Christ brought. And you cannot separate the two. You can't separate Jesus Christ from the message. Because the message is all about Him. The Gospel is about His, his death, His life, death, burial, resurrection. He is the message. And so, so many people try to separate Jesus from the Word of God. You can't do that. He's the Word. He's the message. But John says here that this Word of life was from the beginning. Well, what does it mean that He's the, the Word of life? It means that he, he, he brought the message of life. He brought the message of salvation. And this word of life was from the beginning. Now, John likes to use different words and sayings to mean different things. And that's the case here with the beginning. The beginning. So you might think again of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. You might also think of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And in both of those examples, in the beginning refers to eternity past. It points us to a God who existed before anything was, before creation. But I don't think that John has this in mind here. I don't think the point for him is to, to say that Jesus Christ is eternal, even though he is. What he is saying here is that this is the message, this is the gospel that was preached from the start. This is the, the message that was preached from the beginning. It's not a new message, in other words. It's a message that has been from the beginning. It's an unchanging message because it presents to us an unchanging person, Jesus Christ, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Remember what was going on in these churches. Deceivers had come into the church that John is writing to. What did they bring with them? A new message. This is the way to God. No, this is who the Christ actually is. This is how you can have fellowship with God. You need this, this superior knowledge to attain God. And by the way, it, it's only for a few select spiritual elite. It's not for everyone. And John's saying, no, actually... This is the message that was from the start. He goes on the offensive right away. He establishes the supremacy of the gospel over and above this new deceptive message. The gospel is unchanging. The gospel is set in stone. You cannot add to the gospel. You cannot subtract from the gospel. And we must have that conviction as a church. As Steve Lawson often says, if it's true, or if it's new, excuse me, if it's new, it's not true. We must have this conviction as a church. As all these other churches are blowing up with people and adding hundreds upon hundreds of people because they have devised a new way to attract people, a new gospel, a new message, we must stand upon the conviction, no, that this is the message from the beginning. We will not compromise. We will not give way to pragmatism. And by the way, if you want a big church, remove the true gospel of Christ. You know why? Because it's offensive. It's an offensive gospel. Because it tells you, actually, you're not a good person. You're evil. 
But there's hope. But you first need to hear, you're evil, and people don't like that. People don't want to tell, don't want to hear uh, that, that they're sinners, then they need to repent. People don't want to be convicted. They, they don't want to be made feel uncomfortable in church. People don't want to hear about sin and judgment and hell and consequences. But that's the gospel. People want to be affirmed in their seats. They want to be comfortable. They want to be built up. They want to be inspired. Never convicted. Never challenged. People want to hear that Jesus can be your Savior. He doesn't have to be your Lord. Jesus can save you, but you can live however you want. You don't have to follow Him. And so many people go to church. Why? We like the music. The music, it makes me feel close to God. I get emotional. I start crying. It must be spiritual. I like the programs. This church has a better youth group. I like the facility. No one comes to this church because of the facility, by the way. I like the facility, right? Right? I go to this church because this church is five minutes from my house and this one's seven minutes. It's closer. Friends, the number one question you should ever ask when you go to a church where you will take your family, your children, is this, what gospel do they preach? Is it the true gospel? Because if it's not, you've removed the way to God. You've removed the power of God for salvation. You have shut the door to Christ. And so you might have a big church, but it's a big building full of lost people. Right? The gospel is the priority. And the gospel is not Christianity one-on-one. It's not the gospel gets us into the faith and then we forget the gospel. No, we live by the gospel. The gospel is the message of Christianity. It is the word of life. And so you want to take your family to a church that preaches the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And how do we know this is the truth? How did the, how did the disciples that John wrote to, how did they know that this is the true message? Because this word of life was witnessed. That's the second heading for you. The word of life was witnessed. It was witnessed. Look at the rest of verse 1. John says, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. Again, the what, what, what here refers to the word of life, to Jesus Christ. And notice all of the witness terminology. We have heard, we have seen, we have looked at, we have touched. And all of these verbs are in the perfect tense in the Greek. That's important. It tells us that these events that John is talking about are actual, real, complete events that have a lasting effect. This happened decades ago for John, and it is still vivid in his mind. All witness terminology. He's saying, no, I was there. I am an eyewitness. These deceivers, they haven't seen anything. They haven't touched anything. They haven't heard anything. I was there. And not only John, look, he says we. He's putting himself alongside the other apostles. Not just John, but all of us. We have this first-hand account. He says we heard. John would have heard Jesus Christ teaching about the kingdom of God. John heard Jesus Christ preaching the gospel of Christ. John heard Jesus Christ getting getting direct instruction behind closed doors from the Lord Himself. John heard Christ rebuke Him when He wanted to call down fire from heaven to destroy the Samaritans. He heard that with His ears. And He says, what we have seen with our eyes. He saw the Word of life. John was with Jesus Christ for three plus years. He saw Jesus Christ. He saw Him turn water into wine. He saw him feed the 5,000. He saw Jesus Christ walking on water. He saw Jesus Christ casting out demons with a word. He saw Jesus Christ healing lepers, 
and the blind and the sick and raising the dead. He saw that. He saw Jesus Christ transfigured on the mountain. He saw Christ arrested in the garden. He saw Christ crucified. He saw Christ dead. He saw the spear going into the side of Christ. And he saw the blood and the water gushing out, proving that he had physically died. He saw Christ dead. He saw the tomb. He saw the resurrected Christ many times. He touched him. Many times. He saw Christ ascend back to heaven after 40 days. He saw that. And then he says, what we have looked at. What we have looked at. Now that Greek word means to behold. To behold. To look intently at something. John was locked in on Christ. He was fixed upon Him. How could you not be? No man was like this man. This is why so many people read the Gospels over and over and over again. Who are you? Who is this man who teaches with such authority? Who is this man that the winds and the, and the waves obey him? The demons. Who is this who, who, who speaks in this way? No man ever spoke, ever spoke as this man speaks. How could you not be locked in on someone like that? This man was unusual, to say the least. It was unusual. And notice that of all the senses of hearing, touching, and, and, and seeing, John is emphasizing eyesight. Three times in these four verses, he says, what we have seen, what we have seen, what we have seen. We looked at. Why? Because I believe that eyesight is the most reliable sense when it comes to being a witness. This is why we call them eyewitnesses. I saw him. Some of these deceivers that come into the church... Historians believe they were probably docetists. That's what they were called, docetists. Docetists would teach that Jesus Christ, his body, appeared to be human, but it was actually an illusion. It wasn't human flesh. John says, I heard him, I touched him. Right? That's the key. Look at the last one. What we have touched with our own hands. So you, you might be able to see an illusion, even hear an illusion, a spirit, whatever. You can't touch an illusion. John's saying, no, what we have touched with our hands. He touched Christ. You know, in their three years of ministry, they would have rubbed shoulders together, right? I lay on his bosom on the night which he was betrayed. He washed my feet. He touched me. I touched him. I touched his resurrected body. After he rose from the grave, I touched him. Luke 24, 39. This is after Jesus presents himself to the disciples. He says, see my hands and my feet. You see the holes? Where the nails went through? That it is I myself Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. You see that? Our faith is not baseless. It's an eyewitness testimony, not only of 12 apostles, 1 Corinthians 15, over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ. You remember in 1 Corinthians 15, someone was saying, there is no resurrection from the grave. Paul is saying, well, if, if there is no resurrection from the grave, Jesus didn't rise from the grave. If he didn't rise from the grave, you're still in your sins. Because the dead Messiah is no Messiah at all. But guess what? <laughs> He's risen, and 500 people saw him, many of whom are still alive today. If you had 500 eyewitnesses in the court of law today, that would be overkill. You would be insane not to believe that. You would be out of your mind not to believe that. But this, this is how spiritually blind people are. No matter what evidence you give them, they will not believe. 
They need the gospel. They need God to open the eyes. They need God to give a new heart and to open the ears. But for Christians, this is great. This is great. Over 500 people saw the resurrected Christ. Well, you can't touch a spirit like Jesus said, which is why John here goes into the incarnation of Christ. That's the third heading. The incarnate word of life. In verse 2, <clears throat> the incarnate word of life. John says, and the life was manifested. Stop right there. This is talking about making something visible. That's what manifestation means. It appeared. This life, the life, appeared. It was manifest. This is talking about the incarnation of Christ. Again, John 1.14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. But notice that John says the life. Not a life, the life. This is talking about eternal life. And here's what we have to remember, saints, is that eternal life is more than a message. Eternal life is a person. Eternal life is bound up in the person of Jesus Christ. Right? After Lazarus died, what did Jesus do? He waited four days. Why? So that the Jews would know that he was actually really dead. And then he went. And Jesus said to Martha, your brother will rise again. How does she respond? John 11 Verse 24 through 26, Martha said to him, to Christ, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. You see, Martha viewed the resurrection as an event in the future. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die spiritually. Do you believe this? So to have eternal life is to possess Christ. Is to know Christ. Is to believe in Christ. Here's the key. You could profess Christ and not possess Christ. It's about possession not profession. The demons profess. Do you possess Christ? Is He yours? Is Christ the most important thing about your life? Because if you possess Christ, you possess life. Jesus said in John 17, 17, this is eternal life. This is the high priestly prayer. Jesus is speaking to the Father. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent the Son is the fount of eternal life. That's why John says in 1 John 5.12, at the end of this epistle, he who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. Possession. He is the only life, which is why Jesus Christ is the only way. John 14, 6. This Christ was manifested. He came in the flesh. Which means that any other Christ that is presented to you, church, that doesn't match this apostolic witness is not a Christ who can give you eternal life. This is what John is addressing in this letter. And this is why what was from the beginning, the word of life, the gospel, is what must be proclaimed if anyone is to be saved. And that's the fourth heading. The word of life proclaimed. The fourth heading is the word of life proclaimed. Paul goes on in verse 2. And we have seen and testify and proclaim to you the eternal life. Here, here he gets to the, to the main verb of this of this. Uh, passage. We proclaim. Again, he says, what we have seen, we saw it with our eyes. This we testify. We bear witness to something that we have seen with our eyes, and we proclaim this eternal life to you. The you here is the church to whom he's writing. And you might ask, well, aren't they already saved? Why is he proclaiming the gospel to them? 
Well, it's for the same reason uh, Paul proclaimed the gospel to the Romans. Because the Christian is strengthened by the gospel, is assured by the gospel. We are reminded what Christ did for us. And we draw strength from that. And it may be that for some of his audience, they were not saved. So he's saying to them, no, this is the true Christ. This is who you have to follow and believe in. That's what Jesus said his disciples would do. They would bear witness of him. They would testify of him, as, as Cade read for us this morning. In John 15, 27, Jesus said to his disciples, and you will testify also, why? Because you have been with me from the beginning. And so if you read through the book of Acts, what did the disciples do over and over and over again? They say, we are witnesses of his resurrection. They preached a resurrected Christ, a physically resurrected Christ. In, in, in Acts 2.32, Peter said, this Jesus God raised up to which we are all witnesses. This is the real Christ. He died. He was buried. He was raised from the grave. It's the only Christ who saves. And so John is saying, this is what we have proclaimed. This is what we are proclaiming now. This is what we will always proclaim. The word of life. In fact, the Greek word proclaim here is epanhelo, which means to announce someone else's message. The root word from, from this word is the word angelos, the word angel. What is an angel? An angel is a messenger. They would often communicate God's word to people. This is what we proclaim. It's, it's not our message, it's God's message. See, he's, he's, he's the origin of the gospel. Okay? A, a bunch of philosophers didn't get together and put this, to, put this together, this message. It, it's God's gospel. And so all that preachers are, all that prophets were, all that apostles were, are, are heralds. We announce to you a message that is already there. We have nothing new to say to you. We have nothing new. If you go to a church and it's a life coach in the front stage telling you how to live life and what he thinks, then leave. Does it come from the Word of God? Does he preach the Word of God? It's not our message. We have no right to change it. And notice John says that this eternal life was with the Father. Now this is pointing us to the deity of Jesus Christ. It was with the Father. It's in reference to eternity past. Again, John 1, 1 and 2. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. Only God is eternal. Only God is eternal. In the beginning, God. Not God and. And so what John is saying here is that this Word of life that was with the Father, with God is also eternal. He's also God. The heretics were denying the deity of Christ. You might have a Christ who has come in the flesh, but if it's not deity, it doesn't matter. And so John is saying, no, this Christ who rose again is also, in fact, eternal God Himself. So simply put, John is saying that the gospel we proclaim is of this Christ who has come in the flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, and at the same time, this Christ is the eternal God. And if the gospel you receive is not this, then you cannot receive eternal life. And so I said that the, the book of 1 John gives us different tests of what a true Christian is. You might say that this is the first test. The first test of whether you're saved or not is do you believe that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh and that he is also God? Truly God, truly man. If not, then you have a wrong Christ. You have a wrong Christ. John puts it this way in the rest of verse 3 and verse 4. And we'll end here. This is the last heading that this proclamation of the gospel message results in fellowship and joy. That's the final heading. 
The word of life brings fellowship and joy. So he says, we proclaim this also to you, this word of life, so that, here's the result, you may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The word fellowship, koinonia, means communion, means togetherness. You share in something together. That's what John means by fellowship. But he has more in mind here than, than belonging to the same local church. Because you, ha- you can be in fellowship at a local church, but not be in fellowship with God. You can go to a local church and be part of a local church for decades and not be in fellowship with God. It's tragic, but it's true. What fellowship does John have in mind here? What's the theme of this passage, of this whole book? Why is the gospel preached? So that man might have eternal life. And so John's talking about here fellowship, the sharing together in eternal life. Benefactors of God's life. And if you go to Genesis 3, what happened? What happened in the garden? After the, the devil deceived Adam and Eve, what happened? They died. The moment Adam and Eve sinned, they died spiritually and eventually physically. The wages of sin is death. They were separated from God, who is life. They lost fellowship with God. But from the moment they sinned, God promised a Savior. And we have the Proto-Evangelium in in Genesis 3.15, the first gospel. Look at Genesis 3.15. This is the first time we find the gospel in the Scriptures, and it was given to Satan himself. The devil is the first one to hear the gospel. God said to him, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. In Adam all die. Because of Adam's sin, all of humanity has died. But what does God promise here? A Messiah that would come from the seed of a woman. He promised a Messiah that would come in the flesh. This is not a new message. You see that? From Genesis 3.15, He's coming. This is the whole message of the Old Testament. He's coming. He's coming. He's on His way. Gospel, He's here. In in all of history of the Old Testament, David, Solomon, Noah, Moses, failure, 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 failure. Sinners. As godly as they were, sinners. And then Messiah comes. He's born of a virgin. He's born of a woman to destroy the devil's work and to fix the mess that Adam put us in. Listen to what John says in John 3, in verse 5. 1 John 3, in verse 5. And you know that He appeared in order to take away sins. And in Him there is no sin. That's the seed. He appeared. He was born. He was manifested to take away the sins. Listen to 1 John 3.8. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. You see, Messiah always had to be a man and God. 
before any other religion existed, before more than two people existed on earth, that was the gospel. The seed of a woman will crush the devil's head. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Jesus is the second Adam. He came to restore what? Fellowship with God. Because if you have fellowship with God, you have eternal life. You have eternal life. And if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as presented in the Bible, you don't receive eternal life. 1 John 5.1 Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Whoever loves the Father loves the child born of Him. So if a person does not believe Jesus is the Son of God, a person does not receive eternal life. 1 John 5.5 5, Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? But notice what John says here. He says he's proclaiming these things so that you too may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. He doesn't say so that you may have fellowship with the Father and the Son and with us. He puts himself and the apostles first. And I think that's significant. Why? Because what he's saying is, if you don't believe our testimony, Jesus Christ sent us to give you this message. So if you don't believe our testimony, you don't have fellowship with us. And if you don't have fellowship with us, you don't have fellowship with the Father and the Son. You see that? Apostolic witness. And it's the Holy Spirit that was speaking through the apostles. They were inspired writers of Scripture. You must believe the apostolic witness to be saved. These false teachers claim to have fellowship with the Father while at the same time denying the Son, denying Christ. 1 John 2.23 says, Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father. The one who confesses the Son has the Father also. Why? Because Jesus and the Father are one. John 10, verse 30. I and the Father are one. And so, so believe in the Son of God brings eternal life, restores fellowship. What does that result in? Joy. Joy, right? Separation from God brought sorrow, death condemnation. Restoration of fellowship with God brings joy. Joy. And joy is more than an emotion. You know, people often equate joy with happiness. Your happiness can go up and down based on your circumstances. But joy is a deep-seated, God-given, uh, not an emotion, I don't know how, you, how to describe it, thing that remains whether you're in great circumstances or in horrible circumstances. I've heard described joy in this way. I've heard it described in this way. Joy is a deep-seated confidence in the sovereignty of God. That He's in control of my life. And that because I'm His and He loves me, all things work together for my good. That's joy. You can hold on to that. That's a joy that the world can't take away. Joy. But, but John says, so that our joy may be complete. That's kind of selfish. What's he saying? Our joy may be... I'm writing this so that I would be joyful? Well, I think this, this our joy is better understood as all-inclusive. John's joy and the joy of the disciples that he's writing to. Because when John's writing to them and, and proclaiming these things, which lead to eternal life, and when he's giving them assurance that they're actually saved, it makes John joyful. It's the same idea that we find in 3 John, verse 4. You have no greater joy than this to hear of my children walking in the truth. Well, how is it joy for us, for the saints he wrote to? Because fellowship with God <laughs> brings eternal life. How could you not have joy if you possess eternal life? Amen? Joy. Joy of what, what God has done for you. For me, He loves you. He loves you. Not because of what you've done, but because of His Son and what He did on your behalf. He adopted you. But all trials 
in court have an end, right? It ends in a verdict. It ends in a verdict. It, there's no neutral ground. You can't be indifferent to the testimony. You either believe in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, or you don't. And the result is eternal life or eternal death. John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. Everyone knows that verse. But then if you continue on into verse 17, it says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the, of the Son of God. You see that? Well, what's the, what's the common objection that, that people give us when we say, believe in Christ and you'll be saved? That's it? Just say, I believe? Okay, I believe. Right? Well, that's a gross misunderstanding of true salvation. True belief in the Bible produces a life because it changes who you are from the inside out. And so what does that look like? This is what John is going to get into in the rest of this epistle. The evidence is that you have been born of God, that He has saved you, that you possess eternal life. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Christ. We thank you for your word for your truth, for your instruction. Thank you for saving us, for opening up our eyes to the truth of who your Son is, the Christ who has come in the flesh, the Christ who is God, the Christ who came to die for sinners, that we might have eternal life, Jesus who reconciled us to you, who made peace between us and you. Thank you, Lord, for your gospel. Thank you for this message. And may we never change it. And I pray, Lord, that if anyone here this morning does not know the Son, that this would be the day you open their eyes, that they would receive eternal life by faith in Him alone. In His name we pray. Amen. Amen.